everyone. Welcome to the Emerging Markets Institute's Tea Time, a series of video interviews in which we chat with experts on all topics emerging markets. My name is Mika Berjate. I'm a third year economics student at Cornell and also a research assistant at the EMI. I'm joined here by Andrew Foley, who is a third year PhD student in management and organizations at the Johnson School of Management. Thank you very much, Mihika. And today, we're very pleased to be joined by Professor Tarun Kenna, the Georgia Paolo Lehman Professor at the Harvard Business School. And Professor Kenna's research uh, studies entrepreneurship as a means to social and economic development in emerging markets. So Professor Kenna, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start us off um, with a question actually about some of your earlier work with Krishna Palapu um, on institutional voids. So would you mind just talking to our listeners about what these are and what relevance they may have in this world we're living in today, you know, coming out of a global pandemic, renegotiating institutions, reshuffling global value chains, all of that. Uh, sure. So that, that really dates me. That goes back quite some time. Uh, but Krishna and I were doing a lot of work. Krishna's a finance person. I'm more of an applied math person. And we were doing a lot of work in developing countries together. Um, and we thought that the kinds of stuff that we taught in our classrooms to our MBA students at Harvard and executives and so on, uh, the logic of it always made sense. But uh, students were uh, taught to apply the logic in the US institutional context, assuming that you had a Securities and Exchange Commission, you mm -hmm. had well-functioning business schools, you had intellectual property lawyers, you had people who valued IP law, you had arbitration agencies. And uh, you know, both of us grew up in India, and I had traveled quite a bit, as had Krishna. And we said, you know, these things don't exist in most places. <laughs> and so the same logic would apply for how you think through a business or a financing decision or an organizational decision. Um, but the application of the logic is constrained by the fact that you don't have support systems. Mm. Um, so we use the term uh, institutional voice to refer to something that's missing which is specialist structures that normally help you to get something done uh, in commerce, business, economic activity of all sorts, uh, but are relatively less functioning um, in many locations and are, and are, if you will, deficient in different locations in different ways. So it allowed us not only to distinguish between a class of things that had come to be called emerging markets on the one hand, somebody at IFC coined that term, uh, you know, a little bit before we were thinking about this, um, those markets from so-called developed markets, let's say the US, but also to distinguish between different emerging markets, between Brazil and Vietnam and South Africa and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's where it came from, the idea of missing structures mm -hmm. that get in the way. Another way I say it is, I tell my students, okay, if you at HBS, if you want to start uh, uh, a new, you have a new idea, and you want to start a business, uh, it's never easy, but it's a lot easier here than it would be even in my home country in Bangalore, which is a tech hotspot in the world. But even there, it's very tricky to do a real science-based deep tech enterprise. Uh, when again, you don't have IP and risk capital and uh, arbitration and so on, to nearly the same extent that you would like it to be. Yeah. Um, just following up on that, could you talk a little bit about the idea of contextual intelligence and what do you think has kind of held back the widespread diffusion of this in MBA programs? Um, uh, sure. So uh, the, that's a term I used in an article I wrote in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago. Um, not as many decades ago <laughs> as the one that Andrew <laughs> asked me, but maybe, you know, maybe seven, eight years ago. Um, it's really an evolution of uh, sort of thinking from the idea of very different um, institutional structures in different, in different geographies and different emerging markets. And what I was trying to get uh, our students and our audiences to appreciate is that uh, to be a good, uh, I'm primarily an academic, but I'm also an entrepreneur. I love starting things in developing countries. Um, and I, I've learned over time, school of hard knocks, uh, to, to realize that it pays to be very cognizant of the provenance of your knowledge, like where you learn what you learned and where you learn what you think you know, and then to be conscious of the limitations of that knowledge, right? that it may not apply mm -hmm. somewhere else, to have a little bit of humility about it. 
Uh, and I think it actually pays off in a bottom line sense because mm -hmm. it prevents you from, um, from messing up, uh, yeah. making wrong decisions inadvertently because you know our biases are to continue along the path that we've been on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's some famous scholar who said that, but, um, uh, but essentially you know, it's the path of least resistance and we all mm -hmm. seem to be programmed to do that. And I think it takes uh, skill, a learned skill to pause and say, um, that, you know, wait a second, that work there is, what's similar and different about this? I mean, yeah. we, we do this by analogy implicitly always, but to have a little bit of a toolkit, which is what I've been trying to develop for contextual intelligence. On the latter part of your question, uh, you know, our entire MBA program, I can only speak parochially for my school, for Harvard, uh, everybody has to, has to study this. Um, in fact, for the last few years, uh, we've sent our MBA students around the world to precisely to get them to be uh, more cognizant of uh, the limitations of what they think they know. Um, again, so that they uh, don't inadvertently uh, um, um, you know, become unwelcome guests <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else uh, and more, you know, more optimistically kind of can capitalize on opportunities that they might not otherwise see. And this year, because of COVID, uh, we've pivoted to, um, uh, to sending them not to different foreign countries, which is more complicated these days with visas and so on and COVID uh, pandemic in different stages, but to sending them to uh, smaller cities in the United States, hmm. uh, which in some ways is, is even more contextually distant. <laughs> um, so I'm very much at home in Mumbai, Shanghai, London, Boston, New York. I'm not so sure I'm as much at home in Boise, Idaho, or Wichita, Kansas. Um, in fact, I'm one of the people taking our students uh, to San Antonio uh, this weekend. Um, and we're gonna spend the whole 10 days just kind of immersing ourselves in a different context than they might normally go to. So I think we are finding ways to permeate the curriculum with this idea mm -hmm. because business schools also are attracting people from all over. And I think it's just really important to develop that humility. No, I agree. And uh, when you were talking just now about mm -hmm. this idea of contextual intelligence and why you find it important, you sort of mentioned through talking institutional voids, you talked about <laughs> being successful starting companies in other countries. Something that we talk a lot about at EMI is this recent boom of mm -hmm. unicorns mm -hmm. in emerging markets right now. And something, a conversation we're constantly having is, you know, so why are some places mm -hmm. doing so well, you mm -hmm. know? they have found sort of the antecedents to this recipe, you know. And I'm wondering if you could share with us if you've seen any countries that have laid the right foundations or places that have laid the right foundations and policies mm -hmm. to get this going, or conversely, <laughs> places that yeah. maybe not doing the right thing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I was gonna say $64 million question. It's one of the trillion, <laughs> trillion dollar question, I think, for uh, people Sorry have been trying. free consulting. People have been trying to, um, uh, you know, replicate Silicon Valley, so to speak, and uh, for at least 30 or 40, 50 years, and most of those experiments haven't gone anywhere. Um, I, I don't think I have the wisdom to answer the question, but I, I will say that if I think about places where there are booms, uh, to me they seem to be uh, very different proximate triggers to the unicorn boom, so to speak, that you're referring to. Um, so you look at, uh, you know, um, uh, the Pearl River Delta, um, uh, the uh, Shenzhen, uh, Hong Kong uh, area, which has spawned an entirely large number of enterprises. Um, that, to my mind, is driven by some pretty proactive policy making and a, and a flood of government money, mm -hmm. uh, you know, arguably, I would say, sensibly targeted towards certain things and then let market forces sort of kick in and take off. Um, if you look at Bangalore, which is probably the third after the valley, maybe Shanghai, probably Bangalore is the third uh, area where these unicorns are coming out of. Um, it's a completely different process that, is, that has triggered it. Um, and what I would say is that, just sticking with Bangalore for a second, since it's a town where I went to high school, so I kind of still remember. I, I'm contextually intelligent in Bangalore. <laughs> because I know where the street cafes are, who said what, and where the dead bodies are. Uh, proverbial dead bodies are. But in Bangalore, um, uh, I would say that there is a unicorn boomlet. It's not a boom. Hmm. It's just restricted to one or two very narrow kinds of companies, right? So they're all 
IT software uh, or software as a service companies uh, or mobile uh, computing companies or put something on a cloud type of company, uh, they're not yet very, uh, they're not really breaking a mold as yet. So we're not there at the ecosystem yet to do that kind of stuff. There's, there's very little agriculture, there's very little in medical devices, there's very little in biopharma, there's very little in biotech. Again, because there are so many uh, institutional limitations that prevent uh, key scientific ideas from being brought to bear in those domains uh, so that entrepreneurs can tap into the science and build things. So the, the, the mm. institutional infrastructure still hasn't been built up. Uh, to the extent I would offer a recipe, it would just be at a very abstract level, and it would be something that we've known for a long time, which is, um, you know, there are a set of things that government can, can do better than private entrepreneurs, and that's what they should do. Uh, the, the big caveat to that in the developing countries is that often we have very limited state capacity. Hmm. So uh, the government is not, doesn't have the resources, wherewithal, experience, competence to actually do what you would like it to do to provide the public goods so that we can then do other good stuff. So it's a little bit of a complicated dance uh, as to how, you know, how this you know, public, private sector, civil society should come together to reshape the institutional fabric. I mean, that's why I love this stuff, because it's like a giant puzzle mm -hmm. that you've got to kind of piece together in slightly different ways in different places. Yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit um, any major trends or developments that you see right now that you think will be especially impactful in kind of developing or enabling um, grassroots entrepreneurship in emerging markets? Um, so I actually see uh, a, a very uh, positive trend that is affecting the whole world. And then I see a very negative one that's holding mm -hmm. back emerging markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're related. So the positive one is that it's becoming increasingly clear, I should qualify that, clear to me, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's clear, um, that a lot of the, the big problems, so I started teaching a class at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago, it's an experiment called Grand Challenges for Entrepreneurs, where I'm sort of trying to encourage our students to say, you know, it's great that you're doing the entrepreneurial stuff, but you're, you know, somebody's coming up with a new way to make these mugs, and somebody mm -hmm. has a new app to walk the dog around the street or drop the dry cleaning off, and it's not going to really change our trajectory. How about, like, the really big, tough stuff? Uh, mm. And the answer is that our, um, I'm being a little bit, you know, um, excessively dramatic for rhetorical effect here, but the answer is that the, that our, sort of private equity risk capital system, VC system is not set up to really fund very aggressive large things. Mm. Again, caricaturing. They have to get out in a certain number of years. Um, and I'm a private equity investor myself, so I know how the, how the game works. You have you know, GPs and LPs and have a fund structure. You can only invest with a view to when you need to return money to your investors. So you're not going to take giant risks uh, for the most part. Um, so I think that science is becoming more and more important to solve these really tough problems, but the science needs a lot of hand-holding to get through what sometimes is called the valley of death for the investor. Right? You invest for a while, invest, 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 nothing happens, and then the venture collapses. Um, so science is becoming more and more important, and we're able to get to that science in the US, right? and in the UK, and a few other developed countries. Um, but I think the emerging markets risk getting left further and further behind mm -hmm. because that scientific institutional infrastructure, the scientific institutional voids, if you will, hmm. have just not been developed in most parts of the world. Um, that includes my country in India. Um, China is an exception again because they've poured a lot of money into science recognizing this problem. Um, so on the one hand, I am a huge, uh, I'm hugely bullish on um, finding ways to address big problems, you know, whether it's orphan diseases, uh, of course, different aspects of climate change, um, um, you know, species extinction in ways that are economically viable and socially useful. Uh, but I worry that the emerging markets are not investing in the scientific infrastructure to even keep pace, uh, let alone catch up. And so that, and we've seen the consequences of inequality um, mm. Uh, in our own society here in the United States, and we see it more and more in every single country. And I can just see that that would dramatically fuel more inequality if 
a bunch of us don't get really smart about it really fast and try some experiments. Uh, and by a bunch of us, I mean you know the collective community um, in places that have the wherewithal to 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 think about this. Yeah, thank you for that, and thank you so much, Professor Kanna, for being of here course. with us for this tea time. Um, our next tea time will be on the debt crisis in emerging markets, so stay tuned for that. Um, and for more conversations with experts on emerging markets, make sure to visit the EMI website and our social media pages. Um, thank you, everyone.